Let's take a hypothetical example. This is some data that I've simulated where we have six studies comparing a cognitive behavior therapy, that's, that's the CBT in uh, blue, versus placebo in red with respect to change in a depression score um, from before to after treatment. So we have six independent studies, and I can see that in the first five here, the CBT has a more negative um, median change than the placebo. So the bar in the middle of the blue box is lower, more negative than that in, in the red box, indicate, indicating a greater decrease in depression scores. And while the degree of difference varies a little between studies, the basic result that CBT is superior to placebo is true for all five of these studies. But in the sixth, we see the reverse, about the same magnitude, but in the reverse direction to the first five. And so this is the odd one out. And what these six studies would say is that on balance, we would conclude that CBT is superior to placebo, even though in this one study that wasn't true. But we would attribute this one study perhaps uh, to that idea of random sampling variance. And we would say that we believe the majority of studies and let the majority rule. So this would be the ideal thing. And we might even take that further. Um, and one uh, statistical method, which you've not learnt yet, but um, which you will later on, um, and it's very per pervasive, very important in psychology and indeed many other areas of research, including uh, health areas, is the idea of a meta-analysis where you take a, a, as many independent studies as have been conducted and look at them jointly in this meta, meaning a higher level. So let's suppose that rather than six studies, we conducted 20 studies or we had 20 studies available to us. And we knew that in the population, the true effect size corresponds to a Cohen's D of minus 0 0.5. And we also know that the standard deviation of the change in depression scores across these studies is 10. And we can display that in a, this sort of graph called a forest plot. And what a forest plot does is to show us the individual studies where the diamond is the mean reduction in that study in depression scores. And they range from around uh, a 20 point reduction uh, compared to placebo in the active CBT group up to a six point uh, lower improvement in the active CBT group compared to placebo. But there are only four studies here, these four, where the placebo was superior to the active therapy and therefore 16, where at least to a small degree, there was a superiority for active CBT over placebo. And what the meta-analysis does is to take uh, these individual studies and calculate a weighted average across them, which corresponds to this diamond here, where the line, this red line, passing through the diamond is the uh, pooled weighted average of the improvements in the active CBT group over placebo, and that turns out to be minus six. So on average, active CBT results in a six point higher improvement in depression scores than does placebo. And the way it does that is to, well, the way it calculates the weights is to look at the reliability of each of these studies and give a higher weight to the studies with more reliability. And that essentially comes from the width of this 95% confidence interval, because the wider that is, the more uncertainty there is around the sample estimate for that study. And I can see that if I take a lot of studies, like 20 or even more, that the sampling errors across studies tend to average out. So I said a moment ago that I know that, because I'm in some way omniscient, I know that the true uh, Cohen's population Cohen's D is minus 0.5. The population standard deviation for the change in depression scores is 10. I would therefore expect the uh, average in the population to be, uh, in, in actual depression scores, to be around half of a standard deviation, 0.5 times 10. 
in the negative direction, which would yield on average a improvement uh, in the CBT over placebo of about five points. And I'm seeing around six. So even though the individual studies vary quite widely from minus 20 to plus almost six, on average, those errors balance out to give us a value which is very close to what we know to be the population value. So this works well <clears throat> if I uh, can conduct a lot of studies. I can be pretty confident that these sampling errors will balance out across studies. A practical problem with this approach, though, is that to be sure that the probability of falsely rejecting H0 is less than 0.05, we would need to conduct 100 independent studies. And for many purposes, that's just not practical. Uh, and I mean not practical for financial reasons, for time reasons, for other resources reasons. So to conduct a, a large number of studies to just declare that uh, my hypothesis is supported or not is just not feasible. And hence, we rely upon this approximation from uh, maybe even just one study uh, via the p-value, via the p-value which is obtained from an hypothesis test. So we said earlier that the p-value was the probability of obtaining a statistic as large as that observed if the null hypothesis is true. So conversely, if the p-value is very low, that means that the H0 is unlikely to be true, and that the observed difference or correlation is unlikely to have arisen under the null hypothesis, that is by chance. And that's what we really mean in a technical sense by chance, is that uh, by random sampling error, even though H0 actually is true, uh, we've got a sample which happens to make it look untrue. It also means that the t-value can only be large if the mean uh, difference between CBT and placebo, this numerator up here, is large relative to the uncertainty around this mean difference, and that's the SE down here. So does that mean, therefore, that a small p-value must correspond to a large effect size? And if so, what matters more, the p-value or the effect size? Well, the answer to the first question is no, that a small p-value does not mean that the effect size is large, just that it's large relative to the uncertainty around the mean. It is, as we will see shortly, quite possible to have a large t-value, but quite a small, from a practical uh, clinical perspective, uh, effect size, as in difference between means or correlation. And in terms of what matters more, well, the answer is both the p-value and the effect size are equally important. Neither being significant um, is very clear, but if one is but not the other, that's not so clear. What's really important is that we have both a small p-value and an effect size, which is large enough to have some practical interest for us. So let's explore that a little bit further. Um, by looking at when a p-value can be small, but an effect size can also be fall, small. The first dot point just takes the formula for the t-ratio, and it's just the ratio of the difference between, say, CBT and placebo, divided by the standard error. And that standard error uh, can be rewritten as the standard deviation divided by the square root of n. So I can see, in fact, that the t value can get larger as n gets larger, even if this numerator up here remains unchanged. And that's because t will get larger if either the numerator becomes larger and or the denominator becomes smaller. So smaller denominator will result in a larger t value, even if the numerator doesn't change. 